Well, we just heard some really fascinating things and had a little glimpse at the future. And now what I'm going to do is take us back to where we are today. And we're going to take a look at blended learning and some of the challenges that we've had in my organization and, and some of the successes. And hopefully what that will do is enable you to reflect on any implementation you are um, having in your institutions and also maybe to think a little bit about where blended learning might fit into your, the concepts of the, um, of the institution which you're, which you're working um, in. So I just want to start here with defining blended learning because blended learning is one of those, those, those words like communicative language teaching and task-based learning, which means many different things to many different people. Looking here, the Sloan Consortium, which is now called the Online Learning Consortium, actually, came up with this definition, which seems to be the, the most common definition for blended learning. Integrate online with traditional face-to-face -face class activities in a planned, pedagogically valuable manner. Well, that doesn't help me very much, to be quite honest, yeah? This could be anything and everything. All we know is that something is online and something is face-to-face, -face, and we have to figure out how to do it in an organized fashion. So there are steps to define that a little further. So we have in the United States, for example, this model, which is very um, popular in, in K-12 education. And what we have here, um, Oh, there you go. The rotation model, as the name suggests, um, you are moving through modalities. So you can move, for instance, if you have a large classroom space, you can move from station to station, an online station to a maker station, for example, to a station where you're with a teacher. You can rotate into a lab. So in the case of a language school, you may move your students into the language lab. That's actually pretty commonplace in old school, frankly. Then you have the flipped classroom, which we'll look at a little bit more in a second, but the flipped classroom basically saying that the students access the content on their own normally before they come into the class and use the classroom to practice what they've learned. And then an individual rotation, which allows the students to choose themselves what to do. So within one model, many different possibilities. Then you have a flex model of learning, and this is an online model where basically the online education is the key, and then the students get access to teachers in an ad hoc way. Okay, so that's the flexible model. The a la carte model is similar to the flex model, but what the a la carte model says is you essentially are taking different courses in your institution and you choose to take, for instance, one course online, okay? In the case of uh, language learning, that could be, for instance, if you're doing a skills-based curriculum, maybe your writing, is ta you take that online. In this case here, in the flex model, the person who drives the flex model is the face-to-face -face teacher, generally and determines what the where the online fits in. In the a la carte model, it's the online teacher that is managing the learning in that environment. And finally, the enriched virtual model is the last one. And this is 100% online learning, but with the ability to go to a brick and mortar um, institution to get enhanced tutorial work, practice, advice, etc. So as you can see, many, many different models around blended learning. I personally think for language learning that this model makes a little bit more sense and is a little closer to what our reality is as um, English language teachers. So basically, I think this is a progression, okay? It's a process. And what I would argue is, is that when we begin thinking about blended learning in our institutions, that we often need to start, perhaps, in a module, model one, and slowly move over time to what ultimately would be this uh, flipped classroom model. So let's think about this for a second. Basic online here. This is the, the traditional kinds of online um, supports that you would find connected to a textbook. The things that we have um, had for many, for many years. It used to be CD-ROMs. It used to be cassettes, if you rem remember that. And then it went online. But I think in the basic model, the key here is the supplemental materials that you receive are not necessarily 
integrated, which takes us to the next model. And what happens here in the integrated model is that the practice is taken online, and generally this practice is also managed through a learning management system, which Paul mentioned, a Moodle, a Blackboard, a Canvas, or something of the sort, or the Cambridge Learning Management System, to name one from our partners here at Cambridge, where we can basically do away with the, the workbook and focus the workbook activity here. In this situation, of course, the teacher is able to get a little more data about the student learning and then customize some of the in-classroom activities based on this input. But although it's integrated, it's still in the old model, I would argue, of presentation, practice, and performance. Yeah? Then I would say in model three, you're getting towards what I would call blended. And this is what we call a replacement model, because in this case here, what we're saying is that we're sending the students online and they're going to do something um, that is replacing some class time, okay? So that could be watching a video explanation, for example. But it is replacing some classroom instruction. This is not necessarily doing, doing that. But again, still, even with replacing the classroom instruction, that doesn't necessarily change the teaching philosophy behind it. This can still be in a traditional PPP model. It's when you get here, can you see my red dot? Yeah, when you get here to the transformational model, to the flipped classroom, where things are fundamentally different where you're moving to student and teacher relationship into a new paradigm. In this transformational model, this is the area where change takes place, where the role of teachers and students change, where we require learner autonomy. And so while we progress pretty quickly from here to here, it's moving to here, which takes a lot of time and is extremely difficult for institutions. And that's what we'll look about a little bit about today. So, a little bit about flipped classroom, because um, I think ultimately, uh, when I talk to people in our industry, people say blended learning, but they're really thinking flipped classroom. And they're not realizing that when we start the blend, we may be back at that online workbook first and only trying to get here. So what about the flipped classroom that we have to take into consideration? Well, it takes autonomous learners who are accessing information online by themselves. But in addition, it takes good teachers who help turn this information into knowledge, okay? That guidance is huge. And all the research that we've done within our network of, of students in 28 countries, 250,000 students, points that all of these models only function with a strong teacher involved. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a physically present teacher but it has to be teacher mediated and they have to guide these students. Obviously, flipped classrooms work only when we have reliable and regular access okay, to the content that we want to have and that's still a struggle in many parts of the world. Certainly in the parts of the world where I do a lot of my work in South America, um, especially where we still cannot be sure that that access is guaranteed. And as we'll see from an institutional standpoint, that makes it a very large challenge. So I sometimes ask myself in terms of the flipped classroom, when we're doing institutional policies around technology integration, if we think of this all as a process, then maybe, and I work in higher education, then maybe the flipped classroom is a model that we should introduce a little bit later in a student's career. Okay? Imagine students, I'll take examples in Peru or in, in Brazil, for example, where we, where we work. We have students that may be first generation academics that are coming to our universities for the first time they are having to learn basic academic skills, okay? Now we're asking them to learn a language and we're asking them to do that all digitally. I think that's a cognitive overload to these students. So when we do this is very, very important. We just can't blend our, our programs in the sense of a flipped classroom overnight and think that they're gonna succeed um, uh, without practice and without the guidance. So maybe pushing that a little bit further out. 
So why blended learning? This is the first question that we have to ask ourselves with universities. And believe me, there are many different reasons. And I would say in institutions of higher education, not all of them, or probably the majority of them, are not academic. But let's take a look. The institutional mission. Some institutions believe that technology integration is one of the distinguishing factors in that, in that organization. And therefore, from the standpoint of promoting enrollment in their organization, they want digital. And so therefore, that is a very distinct financial goal that they have. Attached to that is the hybridity goal. For example, in the institutions with which I work, they want 25% of all teaching at the university to be delivered online. Okay? This, of course, has a huge impact in the English language programs as well, and also can lead to a push into online, um, which may not necessarily be healthy. Uh, in other cases, it's access. Yeah? Working adults, for example, who study at night, they need a different access to materials and learning than traditional students. So online obviously provides that access. Space optimization is a huge one. You've got a university, you have a finite space in which you're teaching, you move your courses online, you have more space for more students to study, okay? Graduation rates. People argue that if you have certain courses that are delivered online, that you can make a quicker move towards graduation by allowing students more options to take classes. Attrition. Uh, people believe that by giving you more options online in multiple different formats that you reduce attrition. All of these things have nothing to do, really, with education. And I think when I'm talking about the challenges of online and institutions, that's one of the challenges, because this is what you get first. And then you come down to teaching philosophy, okay, which is our belief in autonomous learning. I think we believe in that, and we want to train our students to become autonomous learners, and we believe technology has that capability to transform our learners um, and to enable them to be, be that way. But, like I said, it takes time. And will our institutions take the time to get those students and those teachers ready? And finally, extending the curriculum. This is another big thing I find, is because in language learning, you know, we go in and we look at the Sefer frameworks and we say we've got six levels of learning, X hundred hours per, per, um, per level, and therefore we are going to be at you know, B1 or, or B2 at this particular time. Well, we realize that arguably we never have enough time okay, within our basic curriculum to, to be able to really validate that we're going to get to that point because generally we're talking about a couple hundred hours in a semester or something like that as opposed to the much larger amount of, of contact that you need to have. So of course technology and blended learning gives us this ability to extend our curriculum and allow us to give more exposure to the students. There you go. So I wanted to give a quote um, uh, from Genevieve Bell. I don't know if anybody knows of her. Genevieve Bell was a real thinker at Intel. She's now moved back to Australia where she's a professor. But she was thinking also about virtual reality and augmented reality, by the way. She's a big thinker in that, in, in that area. And she made a quote which I think is very important when you're thinking about how to use um, uh, strategies in blended learning. So she says, technology succeeds when it meets a need that people care about. Okay? If the technology deployment doesn't meet a need, it is doomed to extinction. Okay? If it doesn't do anything that people care about, it is equally doomed. Think about that next time you get seduced by the flashy new toys from the technology center. Find the need and the people who care, and you will succeed. Okay? I think that's very important, and I've seen that in the implementations in our institutions and in other institutions as well. If you can't identify what the need is, why are we, do why are we doing this, then you're going to have a very hard time getting stickiness into your program. 
So what is one of the ways um, that we've, we've tried to do that? Is imp by implementing language policies that align to the policies of the university so that we can match the needs of a language department with the broader things like that um, hybridity goal. So what we've said is, you know, we must link to the institutional tech policy of our institution. I don't know if your institutions have a technology policy. If they don't, they should. Because you need to think about that and have a plan in order to roll out for year one, year two, year three, and so on. We believe the tech policy must acknowledge the unique needs of language learning and teaching. Okay? Earlier, I can't remember in which presentation, we were talking about the fact that we have to demonstrate communicative competency. That's a very different thing than having to demonstrate that you can repeat a formula or that you can do something in architecture, design, design something in a specific way. It's, it, it takes different technology requirements and makes actually um, uh, language learning a far harder thing to implement from a technology perspective than a very, you know, predictable course that you'll find on Blackboard, um, which basically doesn't require you to speak and ob obviously um, has the, the biggest skill that you'll have to worry about is, is writing. Another big problem that we found in, in, in developing language technology and blended learning is language programs are not degree programs. And hence, they have less visibility and influence. So for those of you who work in the language support section, you don't have the influence in order to determine the policy, and you tend to be sidelined, is my, is, is my experience. And therefore, um, your needs will go a bit disregarded. So it's very important to write this langu the, la the, the language policy into the overall mission of the university. The other threat that I see here is that languages are pushed online first, although other subjects may be far more compatible. As I mentioned, all the list of the reasons for people at institutions going online, well, the easiest target often for them is to push the languages online because, of course, they don't have the lobby that other, that other um, subject area, areas have. So, a language policy that is very clear in its aims, connected to the technology policy of your institution and the mission of the institution is crucial. And in the next slide here, I think here's a great message that the, um, the ACTFL, which is the American Council of Teaching Foreign Languages, put together in one paragraph that I think really says something very profound, really. It's the American Council on Teaching of Foreign Languages acknowledges and encourages using the potential of technology as a tool to support and enhance classroom-based language instruction. Super clear to the point. ACTFL also acknowledges the potential of well-supervised and articulated distance learning programs to fill a need where classroom teachers are not available. However, because language is one of the most complex of all human activities and interactions, ACTFL also recognizes the pivotal role of a qualified language teacher to incorporate and manage the implementation of technology so that it effectively supports the language learning experience. This is the most clear and explicit example of a language policy that I have seen. And I've seen them go 10, 15 pages. Yeah? But this is, this is very concise, and I think it speaks to the points um, and the experiences that we have had. That the teacher-student interaction remains the center of everything that, that we're doing, and has to uh, technology always has to be in service of that. So what we did was also, we said, well, we not only have a language policy, but we also have standards. So we have standards for our, la for our language programs themselves, and then we developed a second version of those standards to take into account online. And these are just some examples of areas where our general standards and our online standards are different. So program definitions, obviously. Blended learning has different modalities. We need to articulate them. 
But also the academic manager qualifications have to be different to do um, uh, uh, blended learning models and to move towards flipped classroom models. And I would argue that in most institutions, that's not necessarily something that is uh, a given, that the uh, academic management has been uh, trained in that area. We need to obviously work on the teacher pedagogy in both asynchronous environments and in synchronous environments if you're teaching, uh, if you're teaching on, online. And I would argue, by the way, that blended learning can also be understood as 100% online with a synchronous and an asynchronous component. It doesn't have to be physical to be blended, but it can be immediate, synchronous, versus um, the asynchronous on your own um, learning. Uh, teacher language proficiency. We have found that teacher language proficiency is even more important in our online and blended environments than it is um, it oftentimes in face-to-face. In -face -face. Because we don't have the benefits, for example, of some of the things that Paul was looking at with the 360 degree, right now in the online environment, we are limiting our ability to see our students right now. And those limitations mean that we have to have better and stronger strategies and grasps of the language than we might have if we're in a face-to-face -face environment. That's what we're showing. Teacher qualifications, of course, have to change. So we need to say that if we are going into a blended environment, our teachers need to take trainings in blended learning methodology. Okay, either come with it or take it. The facilities and the materials have to change. Okay, if you were doing a blended uh, uh, program in a country where student access to the internet is not as strong, then we have to have facilities on site that will enable those students to do the asynchronous work, the blended online work, locally on the campus. We have that situation in Mexico, where in many of our campuses in Mexico, the internet is not strong enough to work with this. Yeah? We need to find another solution. So in the case of those, those um, universities, we may have to give students Chromebooks in order for them to go home and actually work with the, with the material. Or we have to up the bandwidth at our university to make it possible. This is an obvious one, but it's, it's really something that, uh, that gets disregarded oftentimes. And so it's a huge, it's a huge challenge. The same, whoops, the same has to do with um, uh, access to um, uh, broadly internet and ICT support. So how do you help the students when they're lost? How do you um, uh, do the basic things about logging in, et cetera? Those are other areas that are, that are challenging. ICT training for the whole organization, not only in terms of the practicalities, but also understanding that whole blend that I talked about earlier. And obviously, the learning materials themselves have to change. Now, let's take a look at student profiles. And I'm just going from my examples, higher education, um, in South and Central America, Mexico, uh, Thailand, China, many different places. But generally for us, they're first generation academics. Many are working adults. They have limited autonomy, okay? And they come from very traditional backgrounds, our students. And now the next slide that I show you is a description from a university in the States, Fairmont State University, of a typically successful online student. I am self-motivated and self-disciplined individual. Boy, that wasn't me when I was a student. No way. I'm able to work independently with little direction. I have good time management skills that allow me to schedule specific times throughout a week to work on my online course, instead of doing everything on Friday afternoon, yeah? which again was me. I can effectively communicate any questions or concerns to my instructor. Yeah, maybe. But then we saw earlier today somebody talking about heads down, yeah, and trying to be, become invisible in the classroom. I'm not a procrastinator. I will not miss the face-to-face -face interaction with my instructor and classmates. I do not give up easily, even when confronted with uh, obstacles. And I'm comfortable spending five plus hours e each week on a course to review lectures, videos, completed course assignments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, the fact of the matter is there's a mismatch here, 
Okay? How many of you think your students are 100% this? No. So what, that, does that mean you can't implement blended learning? Not at all. Of course you can. But in a progression over time with student training in learning autonomy. It's really ultimately not a technology question. It's a question about training students to be able to learn for themselves. But the problem that, we, that we're confronting when we're thinking about this is we're teaching to the few. Very interesting statistics emerging from MOOCs, Coursera, edX, those big programs. The statistics are showing that the successful completers are wealthy, highly educated, and urban. The exact opposite of my students. Okay? So you want to be successful and independent, but you're saying at the same time we're bringing access to all these new populations, and yet what we're really saying is that the ones who are succeeding in it are the ones who already are succeeding. Okay? This is a problem, and one that we need to, that we, that we need to confront. This woman here, Tressie McMillan Cottom, is a very controversial woman in the United States who talks about um, uh, sociology of learning. And uh, I think she said something here which is very specific to the big problems that we have with our culture in the United States, but I think it's relevant to this. And she says, put bluntly, when learning online, it still matters very much who one is. The social disadvantages of being black, female, poor, and or having physical or intellectual disability do not simply disappear when one learns through the internet. Yes, this is a political issue in the United States right now, but I think it resonates internationally from what, based on what I just said. We need to understand our digital identities. And so one of the challenges in an institution is to take a realistic look at who your students are, who your teachers are, and understand that and design pathways towards blended learning and autonomy rather than handing basically a language program in a box which you figure you can just implement and switch. Okay? This is a major problem for us um, in the United States K-12 education, but I argue it's the same, same thing elsewhere. Now, what about teachers? Well, they're not much different, in my case, um, from the student profile, okay? Depending on where I, where, where I find myself, my teachers may be one sephir level above my students. They came from the same schools. They had the same experience. They're the products of the teaching ghosts of their past, okay? They're heavily influenced by that. And many of my teachers are part-timers, and so obviously they don't have a lot of time um, to, to address this. But basically, we, I'm saying we're seeing the challenge is that the teachers have the same pro problems as the students. And so there's resistance, obviously. And the thing is here, uh, you know, people like change, you know. I wouldn't say that any teachers aren't interested in a new opportunity. Of course they are. But what they feel threatened with and the problem is the transition. Okay? So again, having a, a plan to, trans, to transition from your current model to the blended model is crucial for its success. And that transition has to be based on the realities of who your teachers and your students are. And a good example of this is teaching hours and the work cycle. In a blended learning environment, yeah, um, normally our freelancers, and I'll take the example of Mexico again, are paid by the hour. Well, how do you calculate the hours when the for the teachers doing the work in an asynchronous environment? Okay? How much time are they spending? Because what we're telling them is that the beauty of a blended approach it, for the students is that they can go on, you know, for 20 minutes or 30 minutes on Monday and they can do a little more on Tuesday, etc. But so too should the teachers be able to do the same thing. But how do you calculate that? This is a very practical question that has led to a lot of resistance because people are not, teachers are not really clear about what these teaching hours are and what this work cycle is. Okay? That's a hard transformation to make. So what is the reaction? 
Something that a, a, a management consultant, Patrick Lencioni, likes to call quit and stay. And this is what kills, kills a, lot of, a lot of programs that I found is you have the documents of your blended learning. You have all the pieces in place. Everybody's gotten their computers. The bandwidth works. Everything's fine. But nothing has actually changed. The teachers are doing exactly the same thing they did before. They basically quit your program, yeah? But they're staying around anyway, okay? So this is a problem that we're facing with this resistance, and therefore there has to be a policy in place to be able to move those teachers from the one environment to the other in a way that is unthreatening and will lead to tangible outcomes for them moving forward. Now you saw this, Paul showed this same, this same slide, the Gartner curve, um, the hype cycle. Now I just use this hype cycle here though in relationship also just to the way that teachers and students interact with the blended environment as well. So it's not only products which you can look at in this way, but also the whole pedagogy, okay? So if you think about it, when we start off blended learning programs, you know, the university and everybody is, uh, uh, you know, saying this is gonna be the best thing since sliced bread. It's gonna change, change the world, and maybe it can. But what happens, as we've seen, is that we have the quit and stayers, we have the students that aren't prepared for it, and so there is this trough of disillusionment. And then slowly, over time, when universities and other institutions develop a clear and coherent method of um, professional development for both stu teachers and students to get by that, they slowly get better at it till they reach a plateau of productivity. The goal, though, is not to have this dip like that. What we want to have in our institutions, and if we plan it correctly, is a much more flat line like that. That's what we would like to have. So we want to get rid of this. And uh, the best way to do that is through good planning and a clear strategy. So a little bit about content, some of the things that we've been seeing about content, OK? Um, we're still waiting for digital first, OK? I think we all agree, my partners here from, from, from Cambridge and elsewhere, that we are still in an environment where there is um, the book. Yeah? But if we're going to go fully digital, then what we hope is that we will have in the future is the material that is designed for digital first, and then maybe does have a book, but as a, but as a supplement. And I know, to pay some credit to our colleagues here from Cambridge, that this is the kind of thinking that is taking place, and it's important. But I think in terms of, of, of course content, that's going to be a, a major um, a help for us, and, and it's a little bit early for it right now. I said current cognitive overload. I had mentioned that in the content. One of the reasons why digital first is so important is because we have so much content in traditional course books that it's very hard to work for students to work through this content in a digital environment. So the way to uh, chunk the learning is something that's going to be very important for us in the coming years so that the understanding that students come in and they do a session of 10, 15 minutes or 20 minutes and not sit for an hour is going to be, needs to be expressed in the content itself. However, pathways and adaptive learning, for example, have in principle been very well received as streams for students so that they get more of what they need and less of what somebody is telling them to do. This is very popular, but we have the opposite reaction at the same time from our students. And this is a challenge I don't know how to solve, but the students will say to us, notably here, I get this in Chile all the time, the students are saying, oh no, 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 no. I got a book. I want to do every book. I want to do unit three, exercise two, question five. And if you don't do that question five, you can't test me on that, right? So they're very specific about that. And so there is a disconnect here. What we try and work with the students on understanding is they, at one time, they want to have this openness and this, this autonomy and this ability to make decisions, but at the same time, they want to be sure that everything is very clear and prescribed. The two cannot go together. 
So some of the things we've been thinking about now in, in, in relation to this is reassess mobile. What do I mean by this? We spent a lot of time thinking about how can we put the courses that we have on an LMS into a mobile environment, okay? So, you know, that the students can be on the bus and be doing their activities on the bus. Um, then they can go home, get on their computer, and then go back to the same course material and have it all basically come together based on any device that they have. What we're realizing, though, is, and, our, and we've been uh, getting um, feedback from the students themselves, is that they probably don't want to do their courseware on the mobile device. They tend to want to do that on their laptop. But what they do want is access to content on their mobile device that will support their learning, just not necessarily in the same way as in the um, actual uh, 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 course design. So is, co is responsive design and courseware via mobile a priority? I used to think 100% it was. Now I'm not so sure, now I'm not so sure anymore. So we come back to this, the old crash and term, comprehensible input, and the amount of time we have available to learn a language. And what we're seeing is that if we don't have a lot of time to learn the language, that maybe the best thing we can do with our mobile is expose them to comprehensible input that can support, enhance, and enrich their learning further. We believe in this, in this case of a primacy of video on those devices because one thing's for sure that they will do is watch videos, okay? Ab absolutely. So how can you do that? How can you integrate that? That's one of the challenges I think that we have here in, 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 in essence to make informal more formal. <laughs> in, in, in essence and provide ecosystems and environments that learning that have courseware but also have simulations and also have video available on demand and then obviously social components to be able to communicate with your with your peers so we've been thinking about how to find solutions to these issues I just wanted to give you a glimpse into a community of practice approach that we've taken now community of practice is a term again like blended learning and communicative that can mean anything to anybody. But we take a, a, a very specific um, uh, interpretation into our community. And that is um, a group of, um, uh, of, of practitioners that share a common domain and are working together to solve specific problems in education. And we've been doing this for years. And uh, it's been hard. Yeah? to get engagement, to, find, to, to make sure that people are, are, are participating. But I think we're finally finding the way to do it and to promote both bottom-up and top-down solutions to the problems. So here's a little bit of what we've come up with here. So um, we have a community of practice, and we felt, you know what? They're united to a certain degree, but there is not a defined goal. So if you recall, I mentioned the standards that we had created for the institutions. We decided to tie the community to the standards. And we identified three areas of our standards, which we felt were areas which could be followed and tracked in the, in, in the best way. And that is quality assurance and professional development, because we can quantify quality insurance professional development to a certain degree curriculum and assessment obviously too and then this one teaching which is a little bit more difficult but we can indicate through observation and uh, lesson plans etc the target audience are the laureate English directors around the world and it's a combination of virtual and face-to-face -face summits trying to solve the problems in this case around online and blended learning so it basically works like this. Um, uh, you have a domain. Those are the teachers and the directors of blended learning programs. We define goals and needs. We get strong executive support from our leadership to do this. You find the right people in your organization to get involved, and then you design your programs for engagement. You mentor, you guide, you model, you communicate, and then you measure success. 
Okay? That's the key. And we measure success through innovation and best practice. So what best practice can we take from, from the idea phase, taking an idea to make a good practical solution, and taking a good practical solution and being able to develop it for our entire network, which would be a best practice. And so it's the domain shared, like I said, the this part, then the design and the practice, which feeds back into the domain with the input of the community. And what emerges are all these best practices, and those best practices get linked to the, uh, the standards. So here's what happened when we put the standards in. These are the latest statistics of this community of practice. So we have 493 members, seven subspaces where people with specific interests can work on. Yeah? It's 48 institutions, 23 countries. Yeah? 27,500 page views. 438 documents. And the documents here, what we're talking about, these are the best practices, okay? So what happens is they get curated through the community. So an idea comes up, it gets fed through the community cycle, and eventually they are selected for the most promising ideas. So documents of that nature, 27 videos. The videos also describe best practice. Images, and then of course likes, votes, and comments. So what we found is here is that this is probably the most successful way for us to get where we, where, where we want to go. It allows us to communicate across multiple, multiple universities and geographies and to share knowledge um, and, uh, and be able to, to, to solve the problems. So, I mean, that in a nutshell were just some ideas around the blended learning. I hope it just piques your interest and gets you thinking about some of the, uh, some of the things that, uh, that you might be confronted with. I don't know if you have any, any questions or, or comments, thoughts. I'd be happy to, um, to entertain them. Otherwise, thanks. <laughs> Question? You mentioned the, the area, the, the issue of um, resistance. People would like to change, but when you put them in a place where they need to change, they don't. And um, I know this is happening everywhere. What do you think we should do to motivate teachers to kind of step in and, and, and be part of the change? I think the most important thing is to understand that it's not a technology issue, oftentimes. It's really a, a, a matter of um, a, a, a teacher's relationship to change, to change in general and, um, and to create safe space within your university to, um, uh, to be able to explore and to be able to um, make mistakes um, in, in, in this area of technology. But also just to understand, and I think this is super important, is you are never going to be on top of technology because technology is always going to be faster, faster than we are. So as long as we have a framework for looking at the technology that we can fall back upon, then I think you're, you're in safe space. But chasing the newest innovation, there are many people who will do that because they love it and they're interested in it, but, but we shouldn't make an assumption that that has to be the case. Okay, thanks, Thank Gordon. You. Yep.